Welcome to a virtual study in Sunday School presented by the New Sunny Mount Missionary Baptist Church, Christians Under Construction, where Dr. Brandon Blake is pastor, Reverend Ivan Carter is superintendent, and I am Priscilla Smith, assistant superintendent of Christians Under Construction, and I'm also one of the facilitators of the adult class number two. Today's lesson title is An Unfaithful Prophet. We will be dealing with the book of Numbers, chapter 20, verses 1 through 13. Get your Bibles, get your electronic devices, and let's go in prayer before we begin, okay? This morning, our Heavenly Father, it's again that I come humbled in my spirit, Lord, because you allow me to be one of your children. You allow us this time together to study your word, to try to improve, enhance, and to encourage those who are listening. Thank you, God, for the continued blessings over the New Sunny Mount Baptist Church. Thank you for the blessing of Dr. Brandon Blake as our pastor and your under-shepherd, God. I pray your continued blessings and anointing over Pastor Pray your continued blessings and keeping power over he and the congregation at 4700 West Forest. Thank you, God, for keeping us through the week and bringing us back and giving us another opportunity to study your word. I pray your continued blessings over the Christians Under Construction Sunday School Study. I pray you continue blessings over all that's going on in our lives, God. You've been protecting us. You've been keeping us. You've been keeping away hurt, harm, and danger. Even in the midst of trouble, God, you've been putting that bubble over us and allowing us to stay under your umbrella of care. Thank you for continued blessings. I pray that you go with me. Help me to be able to explore your word and give a message in this study. It's in the blessed name of Jesus I continue to pray and I continue to believe. Amen and thank God. All right, let's let's continue with our study. Don't forget, turn your Bibles to Numbers chapter 20. Okay, the setting for this particular lesson is because Israel rebelled and refused to enter and conquer the promised land, as God has said, they were punished. They were punished with 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And this 40-year punishment represented one year for every day that the spies were in the land. That generation was condemned to die in the wilderness outside of the promised land. But the next generation would claim the land by God's grace. Still, the people continued to succumb to discontent and disobedience, a failure that affected their leaders as well. Not unlike us today, how many times has God clearly given us a message, what we're to do, uh, how we are to proceed, and we are disobedient every way. Listen, we sit, we listen to the preacher, uh, uh, we listen to the word, we get the message, then we go all off half-cocked, not doing and not adhering to the message that God has given. We're dealing with uh, three topics today, and our first uh, topic, our first point is titled, Unfaithfulness Leads to a Pattern of Sin. This point will be taken from Numbers Chapter 20, verses 1 through 5. Okay? Got it? Let's read. And the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zen in the first month. And the people stayed in Kadesh. 
and Miriam died there and was buried there. Now, there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and his brother Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness, that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. At this point in the narrative, many among the disobedient generation had actually passed away. According to the judgment of God, though reminders of their past certainly was present. The Israelites once again set out on their journey through the wilderness of their punishment and they ended up settling in Kadesh. Moses' sister Miriam, who played a volatile part in the exodus from Egypt, actually passed and was buried in Kadesh. Text doesn't indicate what effect her death had on her brothers, uh, Moses and Aaron. It does not indicate that at all. The Israelites were faced with yet another insufficient supply of water while in Kadesh, and once again rose up in rebellion and assembled themselves against Moses and Aaron. This connection is a reoccurring theme throughout the Exodus and Wilderness narrative. The Israelites unfairly placed blame on their leaders for perceived failures and poor conditions, while their leaders bore the responsibility for faithfully guiding the people, even in spite of all their grumbling and their disobedience. Israel's unfaithfulness and deep patterns of sin would prove to be their leader's undoing as well. True to form, during their murmuring, the people compared their current condition with what they had during their time in Egypt and imagining their time in abundance to be far more preferable than what they were in at this point. Not, not unlike us, if things don't go as smoothly as we think, we blame whoever's in leadership. We many times, many times fail to look at what we've not done in order to hold up our bargain. I have said on many occasions to uh, our Sunday school class, we bear a responsibility in all of this. God sets the way, he sets the pattern and everything, but we have a responsibility. There are certain things that we we have to do. Uh, uh, just like uh, in life in general, people can set up a plan of action for us. And it's up to us, though, to follow through and do what we need to do. We have a responsibility in it all. It's not just handed to us on a silver platter. Here, take this, do this, bump, and it's going to run smooth. Uh, the song comes to mind. God never promised us a rose garden. He didn't. He didn't promise us that. Never promised us that. So we have to take, listen to the word, listen to the directions, and then we have to follow through. Okay? Point two, unfaithfulness results from a failure to trust God from Numbers chapter 20, verses 6 through 11. Okay, let's read. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take the staff and assemble the congregation. You and Aaron, your brother, 
and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and so did their livestock. Moses and Aaron approach before the Lord contrast starkly with the posture of the assembled people. While the people were groaning and complaining, being disgruntled about the Lord's perceived disregard for them, Moses and Aaron approach God's presence with reverence and respect. And in return, for their reference, reverence and their respect, God was pleased with them as they came to him. When one um, shows um, the attitude of humility and servant, servanthood, God's presence and blessings are realized most fully. The staff Moses was to take with him signaled to the people both Moses' leadership and the following of directives were from the Lord. It showed to the people that Moses was in leadership and that when he followed the directives that were from the Lord, things would come to pass. Furthermore, through speaking directly to Moses, the Lord gave his instructions both to Moses and Aaron, and this showed uh, that Aaron shared responsibility as a leader among the people. Shows Aaron showed a responsibility as a leader among the people. God's response here is especially noteworthy on account of his grace. Rather than the um, expected rebuke the, uh, from the Lord in, in his kindness, determined to provide for the people and to restore them physically and as a result spiritually as well. This grace and its intended aftermath echoes in the gospel by which we are saved. The Lord's instruction were specific. Moses and Aaron were to tell the rock while the people watched that this was a different method from what the Lord had prescribed in Exodus chapter 17, verses 6, in which Moses was commanded to strike the rock. Through the mere use of words, at the Lord's command, water would flow for the people and their livestock to drink and live. The Lord's emphasis in verse 8 uh, uh, says, you, Moses and Aaron, shall bring out the water. Through the miracle of water pouring forth from a rock was completely and definitely the work of God. Moses and Aaron's role uh, were not diminished in any way. Though pe through people, God would accomplish his intended purpose on earth and in the sight of Israel so that his faithfulness might be proclaimed for the generations thereafter. Moses took the staff, gathered the people just as the Lord had commanded him. Moses' obedience was characteristic of Moses 
up to this point. But then comes a complete transition in the narrative, one that marks the beginning of uh, a series of catastrophic events for the nation of Israel, as well as for Moses and Aaron in particular. Having gathered all these rebellious, disgruntled, discontented, and disparaging people before the rock, Moses spoke, but not to the rock as he had been directed. Instead, he couldn't restrain himself and directed his words to the people who were assembled there. He was frustrated like we get sometimes. So he, uh, when he assembled the people, he directed his words to the people against him, which unfolded accusations. And in frustration, he lashed out at the people with a tone of bitter and self-serving words. Not only did Moses refuse to speak to the rock first, he refused to speak to the rock at all. In his frustration and his anger, Moses struck the rock with his staff twice, a sign of rebellion against God. One commentator notes, uh, as in previous circumstances of this kind, the rock was a symbol of God's mercy and benevolence. So striking the rock was, in a sense, a striking out against God. Moses had damaged severely the most intimate relationship he had with God. Moses was in clear disobedience against God, and Moses uh, was implicated, and Aaron was implicated as the uh, uh, co-leader or the second in charge, Aaron was impl implicated alongside of Moses. They demonstrated an obvious lack of trust in God's plan for the restoration of God's people. They demonstrated an obvious lack of trust in God's plan for the restoration of God's people. And in so doing, they became rebels themselves. The pair's unfaithfulness resulted from a failure to trust God. Yet, despite the leader's failure, God demonstrated his faithfulness to the whole group as water flowed forth from the defaced rock. The good news for us is that God's sovereign plans are not ultimately put in jeopardy by the unfaithfulness of us, of his people. God's going to keep his promise to us. We may get punished along the way for being unfaithful. However, God's promise will still come forth. Point three, unfaithfulness brings the judgment of a holy God. Unfaithfulness brings the judgment of a holy God. This is coming from Numbers chapter 20. Verses 12 and 13. Let's read. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord. And through them, he showed himself holy. Moses and Aaron's overtly 
disobeyed God and they suffered a severe consequence for their disobedience. The Lord responded to their sins by declaring that they would not lead the next generation of Israelites into the promised land. Their decades-long journey toward the promise of God would end short of their goal and their hope. Take notice of how the Lord framed Moses and Aaron's disobedience. You do not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. God's holiness in the eyes of God's people was at stake. Moses and Aaron had decided God's holiness was theirs to defend despite the Lord's explicit decision to show grace to the Israelites in the middle of their rebellion. In their zeal for God, Moses and Aaron disobeyed God. This is a stark reminder to us that even what we perceive as righteous anger may not actually be obedience to the Lord's command. Moses and Aaron were not punished immediately, but their discipline was stored up in the sense that they would perish before seeing the fulfillment of God's promise. Aaron would die in the wilderness on Mount Hor. Moses would die on the edge of the promised land. After giving his final instruction to the people of Israel, which we know as the book of Deuteronomy, the Lord allowed Moses to see the land from Mount Nebo, but he died without even entering the land, just as God had said. Truly, unfaithfulness brings the judgment of a holy God. Yet even considering the severity of Moses and Aaron's punishment, it is important to recognize that God's promises were not thrown off the table completely. His judgment here was limited to who? Moses and Aaron, as in the extension of the punishment for the rest of the faithful older generation of Israel that had perished before they got to the promised land. God's promise to the nation itself, particularly for the younger generation, still was in place. The younger generation would enter and claim the promised land. God does not fall short of his promises. God's judgment is severe and is warranted on account of his holiness, but God is also graceful, gracious and faithful to keep his promises despite the wavering faith of people. The Lord's dealings with Israel gives countless reasons for us to continue putting our faith in God, knowing that he will not withhold anything good from us and he will be faithful to keep his promises. Say it again. The Lord's dealings with Israel gave countless reasons for us to continue putting our faith in God, knowing, number one, he will not withhold anything good from you, and two, he will be faithful to keep his promises. The final verse of this passage indicates a kind of a memorial now applied to the place where Israel refused to trust God. Its leaders incurred his judgment. 
and God still provided for the people. The spring flowing from the rock was referred to as the waters of Meribah, echoing the destination given to the miraculous flow of water in Exodus chapter 17, verse 7, when the previous generation of Israelites quarreled with God in a very similar fashion. Despite the distractions, God still showed himself holy to the people there. And he did so in two ways. First, the Lord showed his holiness through the miraculous flow of the water for the people. And second, the Lord showed his holiness through his judgment upon the leaders for their unfaithfulness and disobedience. God's demonstration of his holiness here overshadows two important elements of the gospel. One, sin must and will be punished by the holy God, and yet God still offers grace to discontent sinners. He accomplishes both of these holy expectations through the person and work of his son, Jesus Christ. Because we have experienced the good provision of God in Jesus, we strive to trust him no matter our circumstances, knowing that he works all things out for his glory and our good. Unfaithfulness results from a failure to trust God and often leads to a pattern of sin and rebellion. We fall into a pattern. We get right here to doing what we're supposed to do and then we become those unfaithful, rebellious people that's supposed to be buried and, and, and conquered. But then it shows its ugly head once again. God is still going to remain faithful. And he's still going to keep his promises. But he has to show us that he means what he says when he wants our obedience and our faithfulness to him. Sin is serious business. It is difficult to consider the consequences of sin because... <laughs> Those consequences often seem delayed so we don't suffer immediately, but he's going to get you. Your sins will not go unpaid. But in the very moment of our sin, we do not suffer for it. Those who are apart from Christ bear the guilt alone and experience once again the fractured nature of their separation from God. Even those in Christ sense a separation for God on account of their sin. Through the reality, the reality is God never forsakes his children as he disciplines them in, the, in love for their holiness. Any rebellion or unfaithfulness is an affront to the holy God. Yet in Christ, God's wrath has been directed away from us and into another so we may be forgiven and restored. Moses and Aaron felt as if they needed, if they needed to take matters into their own hands. A failure to trust God in this way often goes awry. Yet fully trusting God does not mean that we never act. Rather, we are to act in accordance with what God instructs us to do. I hope that something has been said during our time together that you can take with you, that you can meditate on, that you can be encouraged for, and that it will help you in your walk of faith on a daily basis. Thank you so much for spending this time with me as a representative of 
the New Sunny Mount Christians Under Construction team. Thank you for being with us, and I pray that you will tune in again next week for a word from the Lord through God's Word. Thank you so much. Enjoy your week.